You, we were polite to let you ask your question, allow other people to ask theirs. Yeah. Allow the so, people to know the truth. So, the I truth reject. Brothers and sisters, I reject. Brothers and sisters, my duty I apologize that I for father, those of you that might have wanted to ask a question. Abraham, This brother Hadar, seems to want Ismail, to kidnap this Isaac. conversation. Notice that when this brother wants his question to be answered, he wanted this brother to be quiet. That's right. But previously, he was interrupting. I apologize for that. So, I didn't know what manners was. One question no, 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 at a time. Leave it, leave it. No, because he's alive. Don't you mean, try leave it. You mean to you kidnap go. this no. conversation. Okay, instead of Abraham, no. Again, again and again, the rudeness of Muslims and how they behave. I'm not a Muslim. So, I'm a Greek. So, I'm a Greek, so, original Christian, plus so, atheist now. So, you label me without having any I, I apologize. Plans. I apologize. So, I apologize also to the Muslims that I associated with this very rude Greek. So. <laughs>ask a question why are those the only choices that you just made just now that you have to choose between Jesus or new age spirituality so, so he wants to the brother asks a question about why, why did I only present those two choices and the question implies a critique which is valid there are actually multiple choices it's not just a choice between Christianity and 21st century spirituality there's Buddhism and Hinduism and Sikhism and Judaism and there's Islam and there's Mormonism and there's Unitarianism and all different kinds of religions the reason why I presented it in those two terms is because on display in this conversation were those two offerings, Christianity and 21st century New Age spirituality. Any other questions? I was just going to ask, do you think that's true of all Christians? What, what is true? Well, you mentioned about um, that, that you follow the apostles. Yeah. Is that true of all Christians? Okay. And you also talked about conflict. Yeah. And there's a lot of conflict in the Christian history. Okay. How do you reconcile that? Okay. With the truth. Okay. So he's saying, is that true of all Christians? Yes. Because the, the church at different points in history has come together to define what it believes against heresy, against error, against distortions of its belief. And in those statements, those creedal statements, the, 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 found, the most fundamental of which is the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, it defines the basics of the Christian narrative. And all Christians, to be Christians, must believe in this narrative. And those that do not are outside of the company of faith. Now, he spoke about conflict between Christians. Yes, Christians have fought one another. The Reformation is a perfect example of a Christian civil war. When Christians fought Christians for the most horrendous reasons on second matters of secondary doctrine, killed one another by the thousands, to our shame, to our embarrassment, to our failure. And we have to repent of that. But let's be clear, every religion has done that. Every religion does that. Muslims, for example, have killed one another from the beginning. The caliphs fought one another. Muslims between Shia and Sunni have fought one another, and Muslims are still killing one another today, Shia and Sunni. But the reconciliation part, you haven't really answered that. You're saying you only asked about the conflict. One question uh, okay. each. So you give someone else a turn, and then you can come back and have another question. Any other questions? The first people on earth, Adam and Eve, They've been two individuals, man and woman, or you got the, um, Adam and Eve, they got another um, uh, meaning, so, a different meaning. I believe that Adam and Eve are a, a metaphorical imagery for the creation of mankind. I do not believe that they are literal human beings 
who were created in a garden and put on earth and from them all other human beings came. And the reason why I don't believe that is because the language of Genesis 1 when it says, and we shall create man in our image, and in his image he created them, and he created them male and female, is speaking of the fact of, it, it, it's, a, it's a polemic. The whole of the poetic language of Genesis 1 is a polemic against the pagan beliefs that surrounded the Jewish people where different people believe that there was a God for the sun and the moon and a God for the oceans and a God for the land and a God for the sky and a God for this kind of animal and a God for that kind of animal. It is a rebuke to all of that. It is saying that there's only one God and he is the creator and author of all things and in him alone all things are sustained. So when he talks about Adam and Eve, bearing in mind that Adam in Hebrew actually means mankind, it can be read poetically. It can be read poetically to mean that God has created mankind. Now, scientifically, the Genesis story is not too far removed from the truth. Because biologically speaking, the current theorem of biologists is that the human species started from a collective of somewhere around the number 12. The genetic coding of human beings is pointing towards a common origin. And that common origin, as it goes further back in time, must obviously narrow. So what is really interesting is that given in a time when the author of the book of Genesis had no possibility of knowing the common origin of humanity, and to his own observation, human beings were numerous and spread out, if he was just making it up based upon his own observations, he might have well have come up with the idea that the God created lots of people and placed them in different places. But he didn't. He came up with the story that all human beings had a common origin from a common source. And so poetically, as it is written, it is very close to what we know biologically to be true, and I believe that this is evidence of the divine giving Moses, the author of Genesis, knowledge beyond and outside of his common experience that he could have known simply as a human being. And thus it is an evidence for the truth of Genesis. Any other questions? You seem to believe in uh, creation rather than Big Bang, don't you? Is that the question? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. So the question is, do I believe in the creation as opposed to the Big Bang? Right. The fact is I disagree with the assumption of the question. I don't believe that the Big Bang and the idea of creation are contradictory. I believe that God is the author of the Big Bang. Okay. And I see evidence for that in the scriptures. In Isaiah, it states in these words, I am the Lord thy creator. I have created all things, all. By my power alone, I have stretched out the heavens. The heavens, biblically, was a reference to the cosmos. It is a reference to the heavens, the solar system, the sky the stars, the sun, the moon. God says he has created all things by his power alone. He stretched out the heavens. The Big Bang, one second. The Big Bang is basically the idea that the universe has expanded from a singularity. And therefore we see again that the scriptures is displaying knowledge that is outside of the remit of a human being back in the Iron Age, back in the Bronze Age, who could not have known that the universe had expanded. And thus, it is an evidence again of its divine authorship. Any other questions? Wait. You, you said to that man earlier, he was talking to him, you said his belief contradict reality. Didn't you? Is that your question? Well, no. I'm, the question is, the question not speak. your beliefs from the Bible could contradict reality as well. Okay, 
So he's saying that my beliefs contradict reality, or could contradict reality. For those that want to make that argument, they have to present evidence. Jesus turning water into wine, for example. Now, he's saying, okay, that's the example, and we're not going to get into a debate because I want to give other people a chance to ask questions. So he wants to say that Jesus turning water into wine contradicts reality. No, because what the question assumes to be true is that no miracle can happen. And as a Christian, I believe that God is true and that he exists and that he created reality and that he created the laws of nature. And if he created the laws of the, of them, the master of them, the one with power over them, and thus has the right to manipulate, suspend, or to change them according to his will. And therefore, he can change water into wine, and this is not a contradiction of reality. It is only a contradiction of reality if you assume that there is no God. And this assumption is itself flawed. Because to believe that there is no God, you must believe that something came from nothing, that life came from no life, and that order came from chaos, and it all happened by chance. That kind of faith statement is too incredulous for me to believe. It takes too much blind faith to believe that those propositions can be true. So, any other questions? Any other? You know, God, our creator, he got all the powers, can exist, yeah? My question is, give me two examples God cannot do. Give you two examples of things that God cannot do. This is a, a, a kind of philosophical puzzle that philosophers of theology have posited many times in history. The idea that God can not do certain things because they are self-contradictory. So, for example, God can't... God can't create a rock that he can't move. Or God can't create another God. Now, these kinds of questions I find to be nonsensical questions. Because they are based upon a re system of reasoning that is reflective of the created order. A certain basic set of propositions that we find in nature, in the experience, in the world around us, that then define for us possibilities and impossibilities. The Lord God has the power to create a universe in a different way based upon a different set of basic principles, in which that which we in this particular order would consider contradictory would not therefore be contradictory in another universe. And so I find these kinds of questions to be nonsense. I think they're a waste of time. I don't think they are helpful, and I don't think that they help to elucidate anything. Next question. Someone else. You're going to have to speak up. You, you, you just have to shout. You don't have to stand up. Fair enough, fair enough. What's your question? My question to you, brother, is uh, do you believe that Islam is part of the Abrahamic religion? So, the brother is asking the question, do I believe that Islam is part of the Abrahamic religion? I want to say categorically, no, I do not. And the reason why I do not is because this term, the Abrahamic religion, or the three Abrahamic faiths, is simply what, being... What, the, what, sim what, what, one second. They're simply being posited to us by our political establishment for political purposes. The political establishment recognizes that in our communities today, there are people of different faiths making different truth claims. And that those different truth claims contradict one another, their moralities contradict one another, and that this can be a source of friction, tension, and conflict. It's coming on, lads, it's coming on! And so for that reason, they have posited the idea. They have pushed the idea they have sought to indoctrinate us into the idea that there are three Abrahamic faiths. One Abrahamic. There is no, there is no multiple of the Abrahamic faith. There is one Abrahamic faith. It is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Israel, the God of his Messiah. 
And this is one faith, the Judeo-Christian faith. Ishmael was a... Brother, we're not debating. We're going... Brother, 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 brother. Okay, I'm going to let other people... I'm going to finish my answer and then I'm going to let other people ask questions. You, we were polite to let you ask your question, allow other people to ask theirs. Yeah. Allow the so, people to know the truth. So, the truth I reject. Brothers and sisters, I reject. Brothers and sisters, my duty I apologize that I, for father, those of you that might have wanted to ask a question. Abraham, This brother Hadar, seems to want Ishmael, to kidnap this Isaac, conversation. Yeah. Now, nice uncle, uncle Jacob, please show some manners. Hey, be nice, be I, nice, brother, I am Ani. Uncle, Ani Yaakov. Please Salam. show some manners to I other people. Stop misleading the, the people there. Please, yes. you've just knocked a microphone over. But I'm sorry about property. knocking your microphone. Right. You're knocking my message. You've okay. your neighbor so, like yourself. I does anyone else? How dare you? I does anyone I else want to me, ask a question? Nobody wants to ask questions. Yes, he does. You are misleading the people. He wants to ask a question. Don't be rude. So, what's your question? Can I put a link to the previous question? Can a law be created? Can a what? A law. Can a be law? Created. Can be created? Do you want to just confirm for me what you mean by law in that question? No, my, my direct question is, can a law be created? Are you talking about a natural law? Are you talking about a sociological law? Talking about a theological the law, law, the law, a logical law? Law. When you talk with about the, the law, the, the law has Are you just talking about a law with a W or a lord with a D? Yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, law. 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 L A W. Yes. Okay. So, man made law is obviously right. created by man. So, allow, I'm going to finish off my previous answer and then move on to this brother's question. So, as we've said, we reject the idea of three Abrahamic faiths because Ismael was blessed by God. But he is not the promised son of the covenant. He isn't. And he is not the but one the son through of whom the Messiah comes. And simply being the son of Abraham does not mean that you are part of the Abrahamic faith. Yes, it does mean. Because there is no connection between Muhammad and Ismail. Ismail is Islam. Now, Islam is Ismail. In answer, so we reject this. We Muhammad, reject this because Muhammad, it is forced the, the by Muhammad, politics. Alayhi he is, salatu is, the, he the, is the seed of Notice, of ladies and gentlemen, the rudeness of certain people around us and note their faith. So, I want to say to you that as Christians, we believe in only one Abrahamic faith, the, the faith of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of Israel, of all the Jewish prophets, and of the Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ, and of his apostles and prophets. And this is the one Abrahamic faith. Now, wait, this brother has a question, then this brother has a question, and then you have a question. This brother asked a question about whether a law can be created. Well, the answer is obviously yes. Laws can be created. Man creates all kinds of laws. The United Kingdom has created many laws that contradict the truth. They have contradicted the truth and they are seeking to impose their ideology upon us by silencing criticism, by silencing those who believe differently, by threatening them with imprisonment, by closing down public debate. Laws can be created. It is not a wholly good thing just because a law is made by man and their parliaments or presidents or kings does not mean that those laws are moral. The law that permits abortion is immoral. It is a sin, it is a crime to kill your children for abortion. But the Parliament of the United Kingdom says that it is okay. It is not okay. It is wrong and a sin. So yes, laws can be created, but just because something is law doesn't mean it's moral. You have a question. Yes, is Jesus the seed of David? Because you said that Muhammad doesn't have any connection to, to, to Abraham. So he's not actually, to, sorry, to Ismail. Does Jesus have a biological connection? Is he the seed of Isaac? Yes, he is the seed. Yeah. So the evidence that Jesus was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Allow me to finish, brother. Brother, allow me to answer. He asked me whether there's evidence that the Christ was the son of Isaac. I didn't say son, I said seed. 
I'm going to answer the question if you will permit me. Sun is C. Thank you very much. Sorry, so you misquoted me. Sorry, you so, misquoted me. That's not okay. true. The brother wants to be pernickety about his words, so let me be pernickety in my answer. The seed of Isaac was Jacob, and Jacob was the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus was born from Jewish parentage. His mother was a Jewess and he was adopted by Joseph as his son. Wait, Joseph. Yes. She was a Jew of the Jewish tribes. So, he wants proof that Mary was a Jew. That's not what I asked you. If you want to make the discussion fruitful, please stick to the words that I used. So I asked you, hold on, you said that Muhammad is outside. Question. Sorry, question. I'm explaining my question. You're not going to take over this conversation. Okay, I won't, I won't. You really Please not. Okay. Go no, brother, take the camera off him. <laughs> right, I am oh, going to answer his censored, question. Censored, censored. I am going to answer his question. Yeah, question right, and right. the brother they wants they to right. force his way into the conversation. No, I just want you to get my so, the fact of the matter is that there is no, there is no, there is no scholar alive today. There is no Muslim scholar alive today. There is no Jewish scholar alive today. There is no Christian scholar alive today. There is no atheistic scholar alive today. There is no academic alive today who wishes to question that Mary was a Jewish woman. None at all. And yet the brother is trying to make a fallacious argument based upon the idea that Mary was not a Jewess. We have evidence that Mary was a Jewess. I you off because you're lying. I am going to show to this very rude individual who wishes to kidnap this conversation and prevent other people from asking questions that, that Mary was a Jewess. He proves that Jesus Allow me to demonstrate this to you. This demonstration comes best when we see that when Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph went to the temple. And when eight days had passed before his circumcision, and 2,000 years ago, what religion was it that was practicing circumcision? Judaism! Not answering my question. His name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Whose womb? Mary's womb. According to the law of Moses were completed. Who followed the law of Moses? The Jews! They brought him up to Jerusalem. Whose city at this time was the holy city of Jerusalem? The Jews! Can you answer my question, please? To present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. What law is being quoted? The law of Moses. And to offer sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. That is the law of Moses. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So, Mary and Joseph are practicing Judaism. The evidence is clear. They are Jews. I didn't ask him. And go and speak to any Jews. They will tell you that you are a Jew because you are born of Jewish parents. The process of conversion to Judaism is extremely difficult, very rare, and highly discouraged. So, I have answered this brother's you question in total. You have not. Now I will allow other people to ask a question. This sister. Do you know that we Muslims go to Mecca? Who built the tomb? Okay. Who built it? So. It was Abraham. I will answer you. It was Abraham and his son Ismail. Not reply? Jacob, 
May not I Isaac. May I reply? Uh, no, I want to say... Want to no, no, I didn't finish my question. I want to say that the Muslim Muhammad comes uh, from the descendant of Abraham. Uh, what, otherwise, we wouldn't f follow what he was doing. He was going round the cubicle and we are going round. He sacrificed his... Okay, this is not a question, Auntie. No, I'm telling you what we do with Abraham. I am asking for questions, not speeches. No, no, no. No, no, okay. Two examples only I'm giving. I don't want to raise my voice above you. I don't wish to be rude, so please allow me to respond. Answer about the cubicle and ask about the sacrifice of Islam. Allow me to answer the question. All right. Okay. So I'm going I'm going to raise my voice so that everyone can hear your question and the reply, but I'm not shouting at you. So, the sister has ans asked a question. The sister has asked a question. And the question was, who built the cube in Mecca? And the answer is that, historically speaking, we have no evidence of who built the cube at all. The most likely candidates were the pagan Meccans themselves. It is a mythology of Islam that Mecca has been the, mo the, the most ancient city, the oldest city. And if that is true, like we find in every other ancient inhabited place, we would find much archaeological evidence to support this. The Saudi Arabians have presented none. Is Mecca in the Bible? Not one bit. Is Mecca in the Bible? Not one museum. Is Mecca in the Bible? Not one part of any evidence at all. Where is the Valley of Bethlehem? In fact, there is no evidence of a city called Mecca until the early medieval period. Where did Abraham It doesn't appear in any historical record by any civilization anywhere in the world at all he rejects his own book. until the medieval period so the point of the matter is ladies and gentlemen that in answer to the lady's question the one she wanted to answer for herself after asking is that we have no evidence of who built the cube, we have only a statement of belief by Muslims based upon their own texts, none of which can be dated before the seventh century. None at all. And actually, the texts that they use themselves are not dated to the seventh century, they're dated later than the seventh century. So we don't even have evidence from the seventh century of Mecca's existence. Does the Bible say that God will bless so, Israel and make it a great nation? Again, ask people to raise their hand. I will ask you to stop being rude. And when you can sorry, sorry. not interrupt, you will have the right to but ask lying, a question. You're lying, you haven't answered my question so, yet. So, would anyone else like to ask a question? I'd like you, I'd like you, you to finish my question. Nothing. So the question is, how do you get something out of nothing? Well, the answer is, you can't. And this is why atheism is a fallacy. Because atheism surmises that because there is no God, that something came from nothing. That there was nothing before the, cre the beginning of all things. And that spontaneously, and out of nothing, the universe came to be. I don't believe that. This is a fallacy. Don't interrupt. You're as rude as the Muslim gentleman. Don't interrupt. Allow other people to ask questions. The brother said, how do you get something from nothing? The answer is it is logically impossible. There must be something to begin something else. Every cause has a previous cause. And since that chain of cause and effect cannot go on ad infinitum, it must at some temporal point in time have a beginning. And if it has a beginning, 
then its beginner is outside of the causal chain of consequence and cause. And this is why we believe logically that there is a creator to the universe. Now, if anyone would like to ask a question. I think he wanted to ask a question. I, I don't believe in a God dead of any kind. Yes, I don't believe that something came from nothing. What's your question? My question is that I think matter has always existed out of creation. Same question. Okay. I'm denying your statement. So the brother doesn't want to ask a question. So I'll invite those that do want to ask a question to ask a question. You wanted to ask a question. Who is that creator? What? Who is that creator who created everything? Jesus Christ. He say the brother asks the question. Who is the creator that created all things? So, as a Christian, we take our sum of knowledge about metaphysical realities that by their very nature are not evidential in nature from the revelation that was given to the prophets and their apostles. The prophets and their apostles teach that the one who created all things is Yahweh. Yahweh the God and King of the universe. Yahweh, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Yahweh, the one true God, whom we can know through the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the very representation of the Father in human form. Not clinging to the dignity and equality that it had with the Father, but who emptying himself became a man taking on the form of a servant to his father even to the point of dying on a cross to pay for that sacrifice that is required because human nature is broken and sinful human nature by itself is rebellious against god and this is something that we cannot cure or remedy ourselves, which is why God cures and remedies the consequences for us in the act of Christ's incarnation, crucifixion and resurrection. Any other questions? Let someone else ask a question. Creator Jesus. The sister asks a question. And the question is, who created Jesus? The answer is that we Christians do not believe that Jesus was created. He was eternally God before time. The eternal word of God flowing from the Father as his only begotten Son from eternity past to eternity future without interruption in this eternal continuum. And thus, the divine Logos is without creation. The Son is without creation. Jesus is without creation. God bless you, Uncle Akbar. Only one God, Allah, la ilaha illahu. So, and any other questions? Uh, Abraham, did he suffer when he comes with the message for his people? So, did he suffer or Moses? So, the brother asks a question. Did Abraham suffer for the message that he came to with his people? And here is an important distinction between Islam and Christianity. Because we consider Abraham a patriarch. We consider him chosen by God. 
a nobleman, a father in faith, but we don't call him a prophet. We don't say that he came to give a message. What One question no, 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 at a time. Leave it, leave it. No, because he's alive. Don't you mean, try you mean, you mean to kidnap this no. conversation. Okay, the state of Abraham. No, again, again and again, the rudeness of Muslims and how they behave. He has asked the question. Let me answer. As Christians, we believe that Abraham is the father in faith because by God's command, he left his home country to go to a land that was not his own. A land that did not belong to him, but that God had promised to him as an inheritance. And we as Christians are called to leave the ways of this world and to go on pilgrimage to a new land, a heavenly kingdom, a new place, a heavenly home, to abandon the ways of this world as our father Abraham abandoned his own land. Stop interrupting. I'm not interrupting you. Stop. My, my question is very simple. And you may stop being rude. Once again, the third Muslim now, the third Muslim now, who seeks to interrupt. The fourth Muslim now, who seeks to interrupt. Notice the pattern of behavior. The supremacist Salafist Muslims who come to Speaker's Corner do not believe that others have the right to okay, say, continue with your view. notice I have the pattern of behavior. One. Notice oh, the pattern of behavior. You don't want to want anybody to This is, is their deed. This is their deed. They have no manners because their prophet taught them no manners. They have no manners because they are following what about a supremacist he ideology. What about Adam? Notice the interruption. Adam, Adam. Brother, stop being rude. No. I think he wants to ask a question, to ask a question but he doesn't want to listen to the answer. We notice then again and again. As Christians, Abraham is not a prophet. Abraham is a patriarch. Abraham did not teach a religion to people. He simply followed God's command. And as such, he is an example to us I heard you. You that are we lying. should you are follow God's you. command. The of Notice the rudeness. He asks a question. He doesn't want woman. others to ask questions. Oh, man, yes. So, oh, is there anyone else that wants to ask a question? Me. What is manners, according to you, what you believe yes. in? Manners. Okay. Manners. He asks me, what are manners? I take Christ's leading on this, that you treat people with the goodness that you want them to treat you. So if you want people to listen to your answer, you should listen to theirs. If you want people to answer your questions, you should let them ask you. This is manners and you would do well to heed it. Notice, once again, the Muslims interrupting and being rude. I'm not a Muslim, I'm a Greek. So, I'm a Greek, original Christian, plus atheist now. So, you label me without having any response to my I apologize, so, I apologize also to the Muslims that are associated with this very rude Greek. So, the rudeness, however, Socrates. the rudeness, however, is the same. And the brother so who's you you're interrupting you his question, question, stop you being are, you. you. Stop you being you. You're interrupting your own his question. Your stop being rude. So contradiction. Brother, you stop being rude. No. Notice that. When this brother wants his question to be answered, he wanted this brother to be quiet. 
That's right. But previously, he was interrupting. Apologise for that. So, I didn't know what manners was. Exactly. So follow the example of Jesus and you will do well. Treat others as you wish to be treated. I'm trying. Would, now, would anyone else like to ask a question? How do you explain the Trinity? Okay. So, I explain the Trinity in the same way that the Church formalized the explanation. The Trinity is one divine substance that exists as three persons. Or to use the original Greek language, there is one oasis that exists in three hypostases. These three hypostases we call Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And this one divine substance we call the essence of God, the nature of God. And that the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit sharing in the one divine nature are not three gods as some in error describe that they are one God and one God only and that they are not one person acting as three people as some in error describe but that they are three persons and this we know because the prophets teach that there is only one God and the apostles teach that that God is associated with the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and when the church was going into the land of the Greeks and explaining this reality to the Greeks, they used the Greek philosophical language to explain that, using terminology such as oesis and hypostasis. So it is the idea that one God is revealed as three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The next logical question that is often asked is how can one be three and three be one? Surely this is some kind of contradiction. But the reality is that we experience multiplicity and unity on a daily basis without batting an eyelid. I'll prove it to you. You are all right now standing in three-dimensional space. The vertical, the horizontal, and the depth. This you experience as a singularity, and yet it is clearly distinguishable that this one reality is three-dimensional. Multiplicity and unity are not contradictory. And for those of you who are Muslim, let me give an example that you can associate with. If I have a Hafs Quran, a Wash Quran, and a Duri Quran, how many Qurans do I have? One or three? Thank you. So, that is how we explain it. Another question. Let him send you. Are you Muslim? What do the scriptures say about our physical reality and how does that, how does that compare to modern day science and metaphysics? Okay, so the question is, the question is, what does the Bible say about physical reality and how does that correspond with modern science of metaphysics? Yeah. So the answer is this, the Bible says that the world is real. This is not a dream. This is not um, René Descartes' machine of the maniacal genius. This is not the matrix. This is not the platonic shadows. This is not the Gnostics' corporeal prison. Because the Bible says, as well as the reality, the natural world being a real thing, it is also a good thing. We Christians do not see the material world as evil, like the Gnostics do, or the Manichaeans did. We Christians believe that the material world is good because God created it. How does this correspond 
to modern science and metaphysics. In the question, there is a flaw. Modern science, in common terminology, is not concerned with metaphysical questions. Modern science is concerned with natural questions. Metaphysics is statements about the supernatural. And so, interpreting the question, I must assume that the questioner, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is speaking about modern philosophers speaking on metaphysics, or do you mean actual scientists? I mean actual popular scientists. Popular scientists. So clarifying the question, I have to correct the question, because the question is in error. Scientists are not concerned with metaphysics. Scientists are concerned with cause and effect, with measurements, with understanding the mechanics of the natural world. And in so far as they go, they correspond greatly to the metaphysical truths that we find in the scriptures. Metaphysical truth one, the universe had a beginning. Scientific fact one, the universe had a beginning. Metaphysical fact two, that in the universe we see order. Metaphysical truth two, the universe has order. Hmm? Science, I'm on science of metaphysics. Sorry, I've got confused. Metaphysics. Metaphysical uh, claim three, the humanity had a common origin. Scientific fact three, human beings had a common origin. Metaphysical fact four, the land mass of the world was at one time in one place. Read Genesis, that the Lord said to the oceans, gather unto one place so that dry land might appear. If all the waters are in one place, where is all the land? In another. Scientific fact four, the Earth's continents were at one time in one place and joined together as a singular mass. Scientific metaphysical fact five, the universe expanded. Scientific fact five, the universe expanded. Isaiah says, I am the Lord thy creator, I have created all things, by my power alone I have stretched out the heavens. This is the poetic description of the Big Bang, which incidentally was discovered by a Roman Catholic priest. So, why Jesus needs his body after he was resurrected? Okay, so the brother asks a very fair question. Why does Jesus take back his body after the resurrection? There's many ways that we can answer this. We can answer it from the theological point of view or the simple use of the terminology. I'll do both. In terms of terminology, resurrection means the reanimation and the transformation of the physical body. And therefore, if Christ does not reanimate and transform the physical body, he is not resurrected. And so in that sense, it is an answer. But I think the brother is driving more towards the theological reason. And the theological reason is this, that in Christ is salvation. In Christ is redemption. And as Christians, we believe that we, through baptism, enter into the mystical body of Christ. And so, to be saved from the powers of death, Christ must conquer death. And he must conquer that death in humanity. Because death is working its fruit upon humanity. And so to save humanity from death, 
He must conquer death in its working on the human soul. And so, as Christ conquers death, he does so in his humanity, just as he died in his humanity. And this is why, as to the resurrection, he resurrects and returns to a body. Because without resurrecting the body, he does not conquer death, which is the fruit of sin, because the wages of sin is death. That was my question. My question was, uh, when he went there, when he, you see, he, he wasn't human. He came... He, Brother, he, hold, your, hold your second question. Let someone else ask a question, then come back. Would anyone else like to ask a question? He wanted to ask a question. Is Adam prophet? Stop being rude. It's his question. <laughs> okay. Uh, we know if you want to get the the eternity or touch, my English my English is not so good. Touch or uh, get the eternity. If you want to get eternity, if we want to get the eternity, the Bible is teaching us we have to totally obey to the law of God. Yes? What is your question? My question is, uh, can you obey to God, to the law of God, and to the man-made man law in the same time? Okay. So the question is, can you obey God's law and man-made law at the same time? The answer to this question is nuanced. We have to balance what we read in Romans with what we read in Acts. Because in Romans, we are taught that we as Christians should submit to every earthly authority because the magistrate holds the sword to uphold peace and justice. However, there is a caveat to this. And that caveat is what we see in the apostles when they were brought before the Sahandidrin who were the secular law of their time were commanded to not preach Christ any longer and to do so under threat of temporal punishment and the apostles replied what say you is it better that we obey man or God and so Christian teachers down through history have nuanced this belief in this way that we Christians should obey every secular law of man only in so far as it does not contradict the teachings of Christ. So, if the teachings of the secular law are that we should not protest against abortion, that we should not speak against it, then this contradicts the divine command that we should uphold justice, that we should speak against injustice. And so we must oppose every immoral law of man. If the state says you travel at 30 miles per hour down a road, this contradicts no moral principle. And so we drive 30 miles per hour down the road. But if the state says you cannot proselytize to Muslims, then we say we ignore the state because the state is wrong and we must obey Christ. So where secular law contradicts the laws of God, then we contradict secular law. Where secular law does not contradict the laws of God, we obey secular law. Next question. What are your views on Muhammad? My views on Muhammad? So, my views on Muhammad are these. That there's no denying that he was an influential character in history, that he has been a pivotal character in history, that he has been a great figure in history. But all of these praises can also be said 
of Napoleon, Stalin and Hitler. Being a great man does not mean that you are a good man. Muhammad is a prophet who I believe to be false because he contradicts the prophets of the Jewish covenant and he contradicts the claims of Christ and he contradicts the apostles teaching and the apostles are clear that anyone even an angel of light who preaches another gospel that is different to the gospel of the apostles let him be accursed therefore following on from the apostolic teaching which has not changed for 2,000 years I say that Muhammad is accursed a great man in history but a false prophet a pivotal man in history but one who stands in contradiction to the apostles a, a figure of note in history who did some good things undoubtedly but who himself was flawed at a moral level and it was precisely because of Muhammad's moral failings that I rejected Islam and became a Christian because I cannot follow a man who has sex with a nine-year-old child. I cannot follow a man who calls for the assassination of his critics. I cannot follow a man who leads wars of plunder against others. I cannot follow a man who had slaves, sold slaves and traded in them and bought slaves. I cannot follow a man whose moral example my own conscience contradicted. But yet when I looked at Jesus, I saw a man whose teaching about love, whose teaching about mercy, and whose teaching about compassion appealed to all those better points of my own nature. And I saw in him a better way. And that is why I became a Christian and that is my opinion on Muhammad. Any other questions? Can I, where was the compassion when your God was saying to kill the children, the woman, everyone? Where was the compassion? And the slavery and the rape and everything else that comes with it. Okay. Where was Jesus' in compassion? So, the brother asks a question making reference to Old Testament passages about when God commanded the Israel, the nation of Israel, to wage war and utterly destroy another nation. And when I say utterly destroy, I'm not going to mince my words. I mean utterly destroy man, woman, child, even the animals. It was brutal and it was savage. I don't deny it. I stand here saying that as a Christian, I have to deal with that verse just as the Muslims have to deal with the fact that Muhammad sanctioned rape of female captives and said it was okay even to do it in the presence of their husbands. Now, I'm not going to shrink from the difficulty that this man points out to me, but let him be consistent and not shrink from his difficulties. God was dealing with the nation of Israel who had been brutalized in 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Brutalized as slaves. They were brutal, ignorant savages. And he was dealing with them in history, in reality. In an age when all the nations around them were equally brutal and savage. And so, in this time of savagery, God sanctioned savage things to preserve the nation of Israel based upon his foreknowledge. Now, does this mean that as a Christian, I now believe that I have the right to kill and wipe out nations? No, why not? 
because as a Christian, we believe in the old covenant and the new covenant. And we believe that the new covenant is based upon Jesus and his teachings. So we don't follow, as a moral example, every account of history we find in the Old Testament. By contrast, the Muslims say, because you're a Muslim asking the question. By contrast, Muslims say that Muhammad is the best man, the best example. A leading example. So, if he is the best man, the best example, then that means in a legitimate caliphate that is waging a legitimate jihad, according to Muhammad's example, it is acceptable to take women as prisoners and rape them even when they are married. That is the difference between myself and my faith and yourself and your faith. Can I ask you a follow-up question? No, let someone else ask a question no, no, and then you shy. can come back. No, this is to do no the let someone else ask a question and, and then you can come back. Can I ask you how you feel about Muhammad's teaching? About raping Brother, Baptists? can you do that like, sure, sure, outside sure. the camera? Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you do that outside the camera? Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, guys, yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to talk over these two because they've decided to talk across me. I apologise. Is there any... Right, yes. What are your views on stocks and shares? Stocks and shares. What are your views on that? My, idea, my views on sticks and shares. Stocks, stocks, stocks. stocks and shares. Stocks and shares. Christian, what are your views on stocks and shares? I'll be honest, it is a question that I haven't applied my mind to. My gut instinct is to think that there is something intrinsically wrong with gambling in terms of where you're placing money. However, the, the truth is the question has stumped me. I've never thought about this question before. I'll have to go away and think about it. I haven't got an answer to that question. Sorry? Let someone else ask a question. Don't jump in. I answered your question. No, everyone heard me answer your question. So, any other questions? Any other questions? Who's got a question? Let me ask a question. He wants to ask a question. Jesus uh, born uh, with mother, and Adam born without mother or father. Which one is the more creator or more uh, great, you know? Yeah. So the brother asks a fair question. I hope that this time he will practice his manners and allow the question to be answered. The question is, Jesus was born with a mother, Adam was born without a father or mother, and so who is greater? The answer to the question is that the greatness of the person is not dependent upon who or how you came to be. The greatness of the person is in who you are. Adam was but a man. Adam was the old father of humanity. But Jesus Christ was the incarnate Logos. He was God in flesh, and since no created being as Adam was can be greater than the uncreated being as the divine Logos is, Christ is obviously the greater of the two. Now you can ask a question. No, brother, no, 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 let him ask a question. What will Jesus do when he comes back to those that don't accept him? Okay, so, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for your patience. I want to thank particularly those of you who practice good manners. And I want to answer this as my final question. Unlucky. The final question is that what will Jesus do when he returns at the final judgment? Firstly, Consider this truth, that if Jesus, as he does in the Gospel of Luke, 
and the Gospel of Matthew say that he is returning to judge the world, then he is putting himself in the seat of God. Because only God is the judge at the day of judgment. And Christ is claiming to be the judge at the day of judgment. And so Christ is claiming to be God. Now, what will he do? At the final judgment, he will separate the world between those who have accepted his grace and mercy freely offered to all without condition to you all whilst you are still a sinner freely offered let me finish stop interrupting practice some manners so he will grant to those people that have been faithful and true to that offering of grace and responded to it in their life through good works and acts of charity and compassion and the pursuit of holiness by granting them admission into his presence and those and this is particular to the brother's point who have rejected this free offer of mercy given to you whilst you are still sinners he will accept your rejection and cast you from his presence which will be as a burning lake where the flames will lick for eternity into an eternal judgment. This is the answer to your question. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I'm going to stop them. I'm going to take the rest every five, ten minutes. And then if you want to come back, you can. Please note the manners of the Muslim community. God give his spirit and for itself, ladies and gentlemen. And, and because and also of religion, why did you know call Jesus as the Son of God? The and you right don't speak. call Adam as the Son of God. He gave his spirit twice to Adam and Jesus. Thank you. Why you call God Jesus the Son of God? Why you don't call Adam?